Well, uh, thank you very much uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Chris Fisher for uh, sending this invitation uh, and uh, to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the Abbey School for hosting me and uh, to all of you uh, for attending. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I want to begin uh, my story in uh, March of 1629 uh, with a figure uh, not many of you may have, uh, have heard of yet, um, although he's a remarkable one. His name is John Selden. In the 17th century, he was the most famous uh, and influential lawyer and parliamentarian uh, in uh, England. He was also the most famous man of letters, uh, scholar uh, in the country. And in March of 1629, Selden found himself in the Tower of London uh, without any books to keep him company. Uh, he had been imprisoned on orders uh, from Charles I uh, for denying the king's authority uh, to imprison subjects without charge and various other things. Uh, but four months later, Charles relaxed the terms of Selden's confinement and allowed him to designate a very small number of books uh, that he could keep with him in his cell. Uh, Selden, in other words, was being asked to pick his Desert Island books. Uh, which would he pick? Would he pick, perhaps, the Bible? Uh, or the Church Fathers, Aristotle, Cicero, Homer, or Virgil? Uh, as it happens, he chose none of these. Uh, in a written reply to his jailers, uh, which we have, he announced instead that he most urgently required his copies of the Babylonian and Palestinian Talmuds. And this is a fact uh, that should strike us uh, as more than slightly mysterious. After all, Jews in Selden's England were roundly despised, or rather their ghosts were, since the Jews themselves had been expelled in 1290 and would not be allowed to return for several decades yet. How can we explain the fact uh, that a thoroughly respectable 17th century Protestant scholar, such as Selden, would have elected to spend his prison term studying the rabbis? So to pose that question, is to set out in search of a long-forgotten chapter uh, in Western intellectual history, one in which the study of Hebrew uh, became an obsession of the European Republic of Letters. The story begins in the Italian Renaissance as humanists such as Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino turned to the study of Kabbalah, or the Jewish mystical tradition, in the hope of uncovering uh, what they call the Prisca Theologia, or a pristine underlying uh, original theological system that was supposed to underlie uh, all of the great religious systems of the world, pagan, Jewish, and Christian. But it was the Protestant Reformation, unquestionably, that transformed Christian Hebraism from an eccentric preoccupation of the esoterically inclined into a truly dominant cultural and intellectual phenomenon. Luther's clarion call of sola scriptura, only the scriptures, made the study of the Bible a Christian duty and led Protestants back to the original text of the Hebrew Bible and the Gospels to an unprecedented degree. The fundamental program of the reformers thus came to depend on a revival of the Hebrew language. Professorships of Hebrew were established in all of the great Protestant universities, and the first occupants of these chairs were immediately called upon to satisfy an extraordinary public appetite for Hebrew grammars, dictionaries, as well as for printed editions of the Hebrew Bible itself. But here the story uh, takes an unexpected and very important turn. For it emerges that this new generation of Protestant scholars did not simply confine themselves to the study of the biblical text, as one might have predicted. Instead, uh, and very surprisingly, uh, they became devoted students of rabbinic literature. Their contemporaries fully recognized the novelty and the significance of that development. It was one thing, after all, uh, for Christian theologians to learn Hebrew in order to illuminate the teachings of the Old Testament, which is part of the Christian Bible. Although this practice may have fallen into relative disrepute during the previous millennium of Christian history, it was well attested among the early fathers of the church, uh, particularly Jerome and Origen, and never entirely got out. But the rabbis were quite another matter. Early modern Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, tended to regard them as theologically befuddled apologists for deism. 
Why on the earth uh, would a Christian Hebraist have any business studying such authors? So the first answer they gave to this question was fundamentally philological, that is to do with the study of texts, and the biblical text in particular. Because the rabbis, for all of their perceived defects, had clearly possessed a comprehensive command of Hebrew language and had left behind numerous aids to the proper understanding of the biblical text in the form of commentaries and Aramaic paraphrases of the Hebrew Bible, which were very handy. The second answer to the question was ecclesiological, that is, having to do with debates about the structure uh, and proper form of the Christian church. The rabbis of the Talmud had transmitted extensive and detailed accounts of Jewish religious practice during the lifetime of Jesus that could be used uh, to weigh in on very long-standing debates within Christendom uh, about uh, the character of the primitive church. So those were two reasons. But the third, and the one that I want to focus on, was uh, the, the, the claim that there was a political reason to study uh, the rabbis. Protestant theorists came to see in the Hebrew Bible a political constitution that God himself had designed for his chosen nation before they fell from the grave. The institutions and practices of this thing that they called the Hebrew Republic, that's what they called uh, the uh, Commonwealth of the Israelites, or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the political form under which the Israelites lived after the Exodus. Uh, the practices of this Hebrew Republic were understood to be of continuing authority for Christians. And it was generally believed that one could not hope to understand them and reconstruct them without the assistance of the rabbis. So for all of these reasons, the late 16th and 17th centuries witnessed an unprecedented explosion of Christian interest in the full range of surviving Hebraica. Uh, by the end of the period, massive numbers of these texts, including the entire Talmud, had been translated uh, into Latin, although alone with commentaries of virtually every major uh, rabbinic uh, author. Uh, and alongside these editions and translations, Protestant theorists published over 100 studies of the Hebrew Republic, thereby establishing the most dominant genre of Protestant political writing in the early modern period. Indeed, the rise of Hebraism in the study of rabbinics came in very important ways to distinguish the intellectual life of the Protestant world from that of Catholic Europe. Because just as Protestants were becoming increasingly convinced that one could not hope to interpret the scriptures correctly uh, without having engaged in extensive Hebrew study, uh, the Council of Trent, which met from 1545 to 63, decreed in contrast that the Vulgate Latin was the authoritative Bible and that no biblical scholarship based on the original Hebrew and Greek text was relevant from the point of view of church dogma or practice. And while Protestants were frantically imbibing the minutiae of the rabbinic corpus, the Roman Inquisition ordered the Talmud to be publicly burned in 1533, and the Sisto Clementine Index of 1596 banned even those editions of the Talmud that had been purged of what were called calumnies against Christianity by the censors. And beginning in 1557, the Inquisition uh, forbade Jews from owning any Hebrew books other than the Bible itself. So as the great religious crisis of the 16th century unfolded, this alliance between Hebraism and Reformation became unmistakable. So I want to focus uh, today uh, on just one dimension of this massively uh, complicated and really fascinating story about how Hebraism changed the way that European Christians thought about politics. And the one I want to focus on has to do with how it provoked a massive change in how they thought about monarchy. And the way to set up this change uh, is to observe something really straightforward and simple. And that is, in the period before uh, the, uh, the Reformation, uh, the, the sort of century after the Reformation, in the, the, the previous period of European political theory, uh, there had been an absolute consensus in favor of what you might call constitutional pluralism. That is the idea that there are several correct political forms of life and number of correct constitutions. And as long as you have one of them, uh, one of the legitimate ones, you're OK. Uh, and this view they inherited from Aristotle in particular, but also from a whole range of ancient authors. Uh, Aristotle had famously said, look, there are three basic kinds of government. There's the rule of one, the few, and the many. And each one of them has a correct and a degenerate 
Uh, so the correct version of the rule of the one is monarchy. The correct version of the rule of few is aristocracy, meaning the rule of the best. And uh, the good version of the rule of the many is this thing that Aristotle famously calls constitutional government, which ultimately, uh, in Latin translation, becomes republican government. And then there are the degenerate forms. So the degenerate form of the rule of the one uh, is tyranny. The rule of the few in its degenerate form, oligarchy. And the rule of the many in its degenerate form, there you go, democracy. Right. So, uh, so that's the view that they're that they're inheriting, and there's really no there's really no debate about this. Just pick one of the correct forms. Now you could argue that one of them was the best overall, uh, and the others were inferior. That is, you should there's always one you should choose, or if it was more common, you might think that different peoples and uh, and uh, political uh, forms that, and uh, political states uh, might be best suited for different forms. Uh, so it wasn't one size fits all. The reception of the rabbinic texts I was just mentioning uh, completely transformed this debate and radicalized it actually in two directions. And the reason has to do with the debate about biblical monarchy. So as many of you will know, uh, and this, this goes back to the very earliest days of the church, uh, there was a problem about how to reconcile two biblical passages that talk about monarchy. Uh, the first passage is in Deuteronomy 17, and it's the one where God says to the Israelites, well, when you enter the land of Israel, you're going to say, let us have a king, like all the other nations that are around us. And God seems to go on and say, that's fine, just make sure it's the right kind of king, one who isn't going to be tyrannical, who's not going to have lots of wives and take everybody's horses, but you know, if it's the right kind of king, that's okay. That seems to be the upshot of the passage. Well, then you get to 1 Samuel 8, and the prophesied moment occurs. It finally happens. The Israelites ask for a king, and rather surprisingly, uh, God and Samuel both get very angry at them. So why? How do, you, how do you reconcile these two passages? Well, the overwhelmingly uh, influential way of doing the reconciliation, the harmonization, was to say something like the following, although it came in different flavors. Uh, the sin in 1 Samuel 8 is not asking for a monarchy. That's not where they went wrong. It was asking for the wrong kind of monarch. Right? They asked for a monarch different from the one, the virtuous one, that was described in Deuteronomy 17. In particular, you might say, they they'd asked for a monarch like the other nations around us. So they, they were asking for a Gentilizing monarch, one who would lead them astray and away from God. So that that was the way of reconciling the past. What was bad was a monarchy, just the wrong kind of monarchy. And so uh, monarchy itself is not a sin. The people have a permission uh, that remains in place to ask for an established monarchy, and they did no wrong uh, per se in, in asking for a monarchy. Well, the rabbinic sources have two very different things to say about this debate. First, uh, the one, the, the, uh, the rabbinic judgment that enters circulation is the one from the Talmud itself. And this one is very radical, but it's radical in the monarchist direction. Uh, because what the Talmud says uh, in, uh, in a kind of a fascinating passage, and they look at this passage in, first, in uh, Deuteronomy 17 that I paraphrased as, when you enter the land, you will say, let us have a king. And through some wordplay, uh, the rabbis in the Talmud say, actually, you should read it as, when you enter the land, say, let us have a king. That is, it's not, this is not a prophecy, this is a command. When you enter the land, you must ask for a king. And in fact, this is one of the three commands uh, that are given to the Israelites upon entering the land. They have to ask for a king, build the temple, destroy the Amalekites. That becomes the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the view. Uh, and uh, this view, which is obviously incredibly radical because it removes monarchy from the permission category and puts it in the command category, uh, immediately, as soon as it um, becomes known to Protestant scholars, it enters every major biblical commentary. I'll just give you one example. This is the one of uh, Sebastian Munster, who taught John Calvin his Hebrew. Uh, on the relevant passage in his biblical commentary, he just writes, the Hebrews observed that there were three commandments for the Israelites when they were going to enter the promised land, namely constitute a king over them, wipe out the seed of the Amalekites, build the temple for the Lord. So just uh, directly reproducing 
and this goes absolutely viral. But the second uh, reading is interestingly and equally radical, but on exactly the other side. Uh, and this is not in the Talmud, it's in another rabbinic text called the Midrash, which is a collection of homilies, in essence, on the, uh, on the biblical text. And here, on the 1 Samuel 8 passage, uh, the rabbis say, when uh, God and Samuel gets, uh, when uh, Samuel gets angry at the Israelites when they ask for a king, and God says to him, uh, as he does in the biblical text, don't be angry at them, it's not you they've rejected, but me in asking for a king. The Midrash reads this to mean, uh, literally, that in asking for a monarch, uh, the Israelites were rejecting God uh, as uh, their king and bowing down instead to a human being and therefore committing the sin of idolatry. So this is an incredibly radical and incendiary argument. This is saying that monarchy per se is a form of idolatry uh, and that the sin uh, of the Israelites was not in asking for the wrong kind of king. It was asking for a king, period, because to ask for a king uh, is to bow down to an idol instead of God. Uh, why then, this is a big problem for that view, why then did God give them monarchy? Why did they get their way? Ultimately, they get Saul, and then ultimately they get David, they get the Davidic monarchy. Why is, why is that the case? And the answer that the rabbis give is they got it as punishment. That's to say, uh, the sin was asking for a king, and the punishment was getting what they asked for. That's the understanding of biblical monarchy that you get there. Well, this view uh, in the Midrash uh, also gets picked up uh, a little later than the, uh, a few decades later, than the, uh, the one in, uh, in the Talmud. Uh, but it gets picked up, translated into Latin, uh, and the first person to use it in European political theory is John Milton, uh, poet of Paradise Lost. And Milton uses it uh, for the first time in a text uh, defending the regicide in 1650 51. So Charles I has been executed. Milton is writing in defense of his execution and the creation of this new English free state that doesn't have a monarch. Uh, and by way of uh, defending his view, uh, he says uh, that uh, the wisest rabbis, this is what he writes, I'm just translating um, the, the text is in Latin. Uh, the wisest rabbis deny that their fathers, that is the Israelites, should have recognized any king but God, though such a king was given to punish him. So that's the, remember that's the Midrash view. I follow the opinion of these rabbis, he said. And this is what he writes. God indeed gives evidence throughout of his great displeasure at the Israelite request for a king. Thus he says, they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. The meaning is that it is a form of idolatry for a king who demands that he be worshipped and granted honors like those of a god, uh, to ask for a king like that. Indeed, he who sets an earthly master over him and above all the laws is near to establishing a strange god for himself, one seldom reasonable, usually a brute beast who scattered reason to the winds. And thus we read in Samuel, you this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulation, and you have said unto him, no, but set a king over us, just as if he had been teaching them that it was not for any man, but for God alone to rule over men. When at last the Jewish people came to their senses, they complained in Isaiah that it had been ruinous for them to have any other lords than God. This evidence all proves that the Israelites were given a king by God in his wrath. So that's the view that Milton offers in this sort of extremely radical text written in this very radical moment. It's picked up by a whole range of English Republicans. And it leads them, and this is the point that I really want to, to stress, to make a very different kind of argument uh, about monarchy. Uh, and in favor of Republican government from the ones that had been made uh, before. Because in general, Republicans before this moment had been very influenced by Roman political law, and they had a very Roman understanding of what they were after in a Republican state. The reason you wanted a, rep a republic, that is a, a state that, that, um, uh, that, uh, that could count as 
as genuinely Republican is because you're worried about discretionary power. That was their word. A free man, they say, must be governed by his own right. He can't be dependent on the will of another person. Uh, and they took that to mean, based on a freestanding set of claims about uh, representation, uh, that he must be governed only by laws made by a popular assembly and not by what they call the arbitrary will of a single person. So on that account, kingship is by no means a necessary institution, and some defenses of Republican government without kings were, were available throughout the early modern period, but it's a permissible one as long as the monarch is something like a pure executive, just enforces the law, but doesn't have prerogative powers by which to make law, uh, or in particular, have a negative voice, that is the right to veto, to, to, uh, to veto laws, or govern subjects without a law. For these new Hebraizing theorists, following Milton, uh, who embraced what we could call an exclusivist commitment to Republican government, the great worry was instead the status of kingship, not the particular powers traditionally wielded by kings. In assigning a human being the title and dignity of a king, they argued, we rebel against our heavenly king and bow down instead to an idol of flesh and blood. So as the regicide John Cook put it in 1652, majesty is a term not fit for any mortal man, because higher than that we cannot give. It is the usurpation of a godlike state. Uh, and so on. So that's the position. Uh, it embodied a categorical rejection of the status of monarchy and the kingly office. Uh, its central preoccupation was not discretionary power, but rather the idolatrous pretension of assigning royal dignity to a mere mortal. Uh, and so it was, in some interesting respects, more and less radical than the very Roman Republican theory that came before. It was more radical in that it denied the legitimacy of all monarchies, however limited and benign. You have a king, you've gone wrong because you're committing idolatry. But it was more, it was, um, it was less radical in that it left open the possibility of an extremely powerful chief magistrate so long as he was not called king. So uh, that becomes uh, the really uh, important crux. On the one hand, uh, you have this neo-Roman theory that tells you you should be very worried about prerogative powers in a single person, but not so worried about kingship. And on the other hand, you have this Hebraizing story that says you should be really worried about kingship, not so much prerogative power. What does all this have to do with America? I promise you some America. Uh, so, how do we get there? Well, we might begin by supposing the answer is not very much. Why should there? Uh, have been uh, a, a kind of afterlife of this story in America. After the Restoration in 1660, this entire way of arguing about monarchy and idolatry was abandoned uh, in the, uh, the new settlement, and Englishmen did not return to it. Uh, they went back to a standard reading of the biblical text. Uh, the Israelites asked for the wrong kind of king, namely a king who wasn't sort of sufficiently weighed, uh, this was a king who had too much power, uh, and uh, that was the same. And so they just, uh, the, the, the correction was having the right kind of king, namely uh, one who would be legitimate and benign. Uh, the, the reason that all of this comes back uh, has to do with the American Revolution. Because the, uh, the story that I've just been telling after hibernating for about a year uh, comes out of retirement in 1776 and in particular uh, in the wake uh, of the release of an extraordinary pamphlet uh, by Tom Paine called Common Sense uh, that, uh, that some of you may know about. Now, I want to just begin before I uh, say a little bit more about that by pointing out how extraordinary it is that this incendiary form of anti-monarchism uh, becomes salient in the American context. Because the American Revolution itself, although it's uh, not something uh, we tend to recognize as much as perhaps we should, uh, was not at all anti-monarchical uh, in the formative period of the 1760s and 1770s. Quite the reverse. Remember, the struggle over the American Revolution was a struggle over the jurisdiction of Parliament over America, the right of the British Parliament to tax and, in other ways, 
legislate for the American colonies. And actually, what American colonists were arguing uh, through this sort of decade-long conflict uh, was that Parliament was usurping what were legitimately the prerogatives of the monarch. That's to say, it was the monarch uh, who, according to the English Constitution and the colonial charters, was allowed uh, to govern the American colonies uh, in conjunction with the colonial assemblies. Parliament had no jurisdiction whatsoever. And so what they were arguing in a manner that shocked their English contemporaries was for a revived sense of the powers of the English crown. The English crown, remember, had not been independent of Parliament uh, since the two English revolutions that the English had fought uh, in the 17th century to subject the kings to Parliament. Uh, the Americans were arguing, as it were, to pull them apart again and have the king separate from Parliament, exercising this extremely broad imperial role. Uh, they were also urging George III to revive the veto no English monarch could veto a bill, uh, they thought, uh, since the Glorious Revolution, 1688-9. Actually, they were a little wrong about that, but not much. Um, and they were arguing that the king should re revive this, this uh, defunct prerogative of the crown and strike down the parliamentary bills to which they objected. So their position was, uh, we want a lot more monarchy, not less. That was uh, the conflict. And their opponents in Britain were not calling them Republicans. They were calling them absolutists and jackals. That's to say, uh, they were arguing that uh, what they were really on about was to um, throw the weight of the Constitution back into the crown. So what happens? Well, what happens is George III uh, believes that what the American colonists are asking him to do uh, is straightforwardly unconstitutional. And so he refuses. Uh, and he refuses finally and momentously uh, in October of 1775, he gives the speech to Parliament. He says uh, that the Americans are in rebellion. Uh, he removes us from the royal protection uh, and uh, entirely rejects the American constitutional argument. It takes about three months for the text of that speech to reach England. When it uh, to reach America, rather. When it does, uh, it produces a trauma, this enormous sense of shock and betrayal uh, all of these uh, colonial uh, theorists and politicians had been putting all of their hope in the king uh, for a solution to the imperial crisis uh, and a settlement to the dispute, uh, and now he had rejected them. And, uh, and the sense of betrayal was enormous. And just at this moment, Payne releases his anonymous pamphlet. Uh, and at the center of this pamphlet is a discussion of uh, monarchy and hereditary succession. Uh, in which Paine, for the very first time since the 1650s, uh, goes back uh, to the Miltonic argument. And he basically quotes it directly. This is the key passage that, uh, that everyone picks up. Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from which the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. The heathens paid divine honors to their deceased kings, and the Christian world hath improved on the, on the uh, plan by doing the same to their living ones. How impious is the title of sacred majesty applied to a worm who in the midst of his splendor is crumbling into dust. Near 3,000 years passed from the Mosaic account of the creation till the Jews under a national delusion requested a king. Till then their form of government was a kind of republic administered by a judge and elders of the tribes. Kings they had none, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the idolatrous homage which is paid to the persons of kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty, ever jealous of his honor, should disapprove of a form of government which so impiously invades the prerogatives of heaven. So that's pain, uh, writing in common sense. And the key point that he wants to make is, this is not optional. You know, there isn't an okay form of monarchy uh, that you can have if you want. Monarchy is completely unacceptable because it's idolatrous. This sparked an extraordinary continental-wide uh, debate. Some people thought this was very new, this argument uh, that Paine was making, uh, and, uh, and attacked its, uh, its novelty. But Paine himself uh, and his more sophisticated readers were aware it wasn't new at all. Uh, this is what Paine says, uh, John Adams, 
uh, reports a conversation with him uh, in 1776 uh, in his memoirs later in life, and he's, this is what he says. He says, uh, I told him further that the reasoning from the Old Testament in common sense was ridiculous, and I could hardly think him sincere. Adam was not a fan of, uh, of the pamphlet. Uh, at this, Paine laughed and said he'd taken his ideas in that part from Milton, and then expressed a contempt of the Old Testament and indeed of the Bible at large, which surprised me. So, uh, so Paine himself uh, knew exactly uh, what he was up to, and the stakes were enormous. Uh, this was the great bestseller of the American 18th century. Uh, it, print, it sold 100,000 copies almost instantly, uh, but that vastly understates its circulation because it was reprinted in virtually every colonial newspaper in excerpts. And everyone commented on how it was transforming the terms of debate. This is just to give you one example. George Washington, writing in April of 76, my countrymen I know from their form of government and steady attachment heretofore to royalty will come reluctantly into the idea of an independency. But time and persecution brings many wonderful things to pass. And by private letters which I have lately received from Virginia, I find common sense is working a powerful change there in the minds of many men. And this was true uh, in, in all of the colonies. And it was understood by the first uh, historians uh, of the revolution uh, who uh, already in the 1780s were arguing that this was the key moment, this moment when Paine mobilized this distinctively biblical argument against monarchy uh, for the revolutionary cause. The great worry of Paine's opponents, and not uh, just loyalists, but his opponents like Adams uh, in the patriot movement itself, uh, was that he shifted the focus of conversation uh, away from where it should be, namely to the potentially enslaving kingly powers that we should avoid, toward the alleged evil of the very title of king. Uh, Payne, after all, had himself gone out of his way to insist that the English monarchy was illicit being, despite being virtually powerless. Uh, the worry was just this status, this monarchical status. Uh, and that worry Payne's opponents uh, that you might, instead of uh, focusing where you should on dangerous prerogative powers, you might end up making your peace with prerogative powers as long as the person wielding them does not have the kingly status. That is, they were arguing that Paine's pamphlet was encouraging colonial readers to become anxious about precisely the wrong things, to pursue shadow over substance. So long as their chief magistrate is not the whole king, they will feel that the appropriate political principles have been satisfied fully. They will not fret at all about the sweeping prerogative powers that their suitably rechristened governors might come to wield. Uh, and that, uh, that was uh, the, uh, the anxiety, as one of his critics put it. It is trifling to find fault with the term. Uh, the harm lies not in the four letters K-I-N-G. That's the mistake. But they lost. They lost clearly and momentously. Paine's argument was picked up by every imaginable source, uh, from high literature to pamphlets, uh, and it absolutely carries uh, the day. Uh, here is uh, John Murray, uh, Newburyport, celebrating the peace of Paris of 1783 that ends the Revolutionary War. Now hail thy deliverer God, he writes. Worship without fear of man. This day invite him to the crown of America. Proclaim him king of the land. Such a coronation, he goes on to explain, has been made possible by the extraordinary virtue and piety of the Americans and their leaders. Uh, in the Hebrew Republic of old, as Paine had recounted, Gideon was invited to become king, but he recognized that the, power, that the reigns of kingly authority become no other hands than those of the all-perfect sovereign of the universe, only God is fit to sit monarch on a throne. Before him only every near knee should bow. At his feet should sceptered mortals cast their crowns. There should they lay them down to resume and wear them no more forever. And he who refuses this rightful homage to the only supreme deserves to be treated as a tyrant among men and a rebel against God. Uh, what we should proclaim as he ends his pamphlet, declaring is that God alone shall be king of America. But even Paine's most uh, dogged critics recognize the power and import of his intervention. I'm just going to give you one of them in closing. 
Uh, and this is a Philadelphia writer who published in the Pennsylvania Ledger uh, under the pseudonym The Moderator. And he categorically rejected Payne's argument for independence, but he also argued uh, about, and uh, offered an extraordinary sort of testimony of how Payne's anti monarchical rhetoric had quite literally captured his imagination. This is what he said. When the pamphlet called Common Sense first appeared, I found myself staggered with the high-wrought declamations against monarchy in general and of Britain in particular. I viewed the royal brute with an indignant frown and began to new mold my monarchical sentiments into those of the Commonwealth, whose virtue should reign triumphant and vice be expelled from the land. I read it a second time, and with more deliberation, and uninfluenced by those impressions which are generally made by novelty, for I am one of those who have a wonderful aptitude to be smitten with anything that is grand, a lake, a mountain, a temple, or a capacious thought that includes a thousand words, immediately captivate my fancy. It instantly gets upon the wing, ranges with delight through the extensive scene, and forgets for a moment the real objects around me. Such had been the situation of my mind when I surrendered the reins of my imagination to the guidance of the ingenious author of common sense. We soared aloft into the wilds of fancy, the dull beaten tracks of monarchy we left far behind us, and found a republic amidst the stars. And though the sun might seem to admiring mortals below, the grand monarch of the heavenly bodies, yet we found other suns and other worlds innumerable, which might only be considered as presidents, not monarchs, of the vast system. Everywhere shone a republic. The various constellations which enspangle the sky united upon the principles of perfect equality and gravitating toward each other with wonderful adjustment, mutually attracted and mutually repelled. Thus, gentle reader, was my imagination led captive with fiery velocity. So in due course, moderator had returned, as he says, like Noah's dove, to dry ground. But he nonetheless vividly recalled the sublimity of the journey on which pain had taken him. He'd been persuaded, however fleetingly, to leave behind the dull, beaten tracks of monarchy, as he said, and to recognize that just as the sun itself is a mere president in the eyes of the creator of the vast system of the universe, and no grand monarch of the heavenly bodies, so too there is no human being on earth who is fit to be styled king. Whatever the delusions of admiring mortals below, uh, God alone is the true monarch. Unlike moderator, the vast majority of British North Americans never came back down to earth. They thoroughly absorbed Paine's liberalizing exclusivist argument against kingship, rendering it virtually unthinkable that an American monarchy would be established at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. But it was precisely because Paine had so effectively altered the focus of political debate from the enslaving effects of kingly powers to the idolatrous pretensions of the office of king that it later became possible for Americans to reconcile republicanism with prerogative. Looking back on the period of the founding in old age, John Adams shared the following vignette with a correspondent. He says, the Prince of Orange, William V, in a conversation with which he honored me in 1788, was pleased to say that he had read our new constitution. And he added, Monsieur, vous allez avoir un roi sous le titre du président, which may be translated, Sir, you have given yourselves a king under the title of president. Uh, Trudeau, Washbucco, Condorcet, and the others were all offended that we had given too much éclat to our governors and presidents. It is true, and I rejoice in it, that our presidents, limited as they are, uh, have more power than the stockholders, the doges, the podestas, or the archons, or the kings of Lacedaemon that is Sparta or of Poland. Indeed, Adams had observed as early as 1789 that I know of no first magistrate in any Republican government except in England who possesses a constitutional dignity, authority, and power comparable to the President's. His prerogatives and dignities are so transcendent that they must naturally and necessarily excite in the nation all the jealousy, envy, fears, apprehension, and opposition that are so constantly observed in England against the crown. So once the title of king had been abolished in accordance with the demands of scripture, Americans were eventually able to make their peace with kingly power. Let us now consider what our constitution is, Adams wrote, and see whether any other name can with propriety be given it 
than that of a monarchical republic, or if you will, a limited monarchy. The great French political theorist Montesquieu had famously characterized England as a republic disguised under the form of a monarchy, thanks in large part to the Hebraizing turn initiated by Paine, the new United States would become the reverse. Thank you.